Awesome. So Nadina, while you're pulling that up, just very quick intro. I think everybody here is probably familiar with Nadina and all the work that she does in the community and on the platform. But um, Nadina has like all the credentials, Salesforce certified architect, Salesforce MVP, Salesforce golden hoodie, um, <laughs> speaks at events, all things integration, all things enterprise architecture, all things um, Salesforce architecture. So um, Nadina, we are super excited that you're here and we're super nice excited. Salesforce. Hey, Pe huh. Pencock, can I'm going to mute you, okay? There you go. Um, so Nadina, we are super excited that you're here. So um, the floor is yours. Why don't you take it away? Perfect. And just so can everyone see um, the screen okay? And then can you see these other tabs I have open? Yeah, we can see. Your, well, I can see your full browser. Okay, perfect. Cool, cool. Um, so thank you so much, Brian, Zach, uh, Melissa. I can't remember who else is in the group for having me. Um, so today what we'll be talking about is Salesforce Event Relay and Amazon Event Bridge. As Brian mentioned, my name is Nadina Lisbon. So I'm a Salesforce Certified Technical Architect, a Salesforce MVP, MuleSoft Ambassador. I work as a CRM Enterprise Architect at NetApp. I'm also a Golden Hoodie, many other things. But what I really enjoy doing is talking and right-sizing conversations so that everyone can have a clear understanding of topics. And that's one of my superpowers is to take very complex topics and make them very simple and understandable for anyone who's in the room. So that's what I'm going to attempt to do today. So what we'll talk about is we'll talk a little bit about event-driven integrations. We'll talk about some of the, we call the high level more things. Then we'll really get into what is Salesforce event relay. We'll talk about Amazon event bridge. We'll talk about some guiding principles that I use. In between the presentation, I'll actually switch tabs so that I can give you a better visual on Event Relay, on an Amazon Event Bridge, and then show you a one-way connection between Salesforce using Event Relay, using um, Amazon Event Bridge. I am not going to show it to it um, today, but you'll get kind of the picture on how we can use it and best do it. And then just my call to action slides on, you know, getting started and things like that. So the first thing I always like to start with is how do we connect? And there's a bunch of ways you can connect to Salesforce. And when you talk about connections for this specific topic, we'll be talking about event-driven integration. And the way I see them as flexible integration patterns that can drive real-time customer experience at scale. And because we're talking about so much technologies, I wanted to have a very broad overview of everything that we'll be talking about. So from a Salesforce perspective, we have our Salesforce platform, we have the Salesforce event bus, and in there is where the Salesforce event really lives. And then we have our Amazon ecosystem and the event bridge. Now, when it comes to the event bridge, it acts similar to the Salesforce event bus in that it can transmit different events across those different ecosystems. So from an Amazon perspective, the event bridge works very well with your CloudWatch, your Lambda, your simple notifications, et cetera. And then from a Salesforce event bus perspective, it works with your standard clouds, sales, service, commerce. And then you have some other different um different um, things on there as well. So like MuleSoft to connect to your external systems. You have your marketing system, like Marketing Cloud, also reporting from Tableau. And then you have your other platform tools that you can use. And so when I talk about Salesforce Event Relay, why do we care about it from using Stuart's words? Event Relay and how I like to look at it is the connectivity tissue between Salesforce Event Bus and then your AWS systems. So really what Event Relay's strength is around sending your platform events, your change data capture events between Salesforce and Amazon. So it acts as that connectivity tissue. Why we care about this is that prior to Event Relay being there, there were a couple of other products that you could use. So Amazon actually had Amazon AppFlow that you could send information from an Amazon side. And then from a Salesforce side, there wasn't really a good way to do it unless you built a custom integration. 
And so that's where event really was created and configured specifically to work with the Amazon Web Services AWS ecosystem and stream those events, of course. So some of the key features when it comes to event really, um, and I took this directly from the documentation. So it's a lot of words, but listen to my voice. Don't necessarily read all the topic. You can look at this after you have it is it helps with that bi-directional flow. So between Salesforce and AWS, paths and events back and forth. I like to say it plays a really good game of telephone where you have a sender and a receiver. And as soon as that connection is made, those events will pass through. It also is really good for processing your Salesforce events um, in AWS. So once that event has been um, sent by an event relay and is in the AWS ecosystem, Typically, from my integration perspective, especially if you're working maybe as Salesforce yeah. developer, you might not necessarily want to concern yourself with what is happening on the AWS, AWS side. And so it helps to obfuscate or not have to think about what the AWS side is doing because it's a standard way and a standard protocol in how to do it. And AWS can also connect with other SaaS integrations, but again, we're talking about Salesforce and AWS. And then the other thing that we can do is we can bring events back from AWS to Salesforce. So really making that direct connection with your Salesforce platform and your Salesforce event. I'm going to take a pause. Did I lose anybody so far? I'm going to take quiet I, as I, holding. I, I think that's that's good. Um... I'm trying to think of before before this event relay was available, did uh, I may be saying things you can correct me. Mm -hmm. was the was the way that most organizations got data to and from Amazon, like that'd be maybe sending files to an s three bucket, yeah, and then and then having uh, Amazon process those files and then somehow getting that data back. I, I'm not sure how you'd get the data back, but but there'd be some process before this was available to us. Yes, and there was on the Amazon side, um, specifically there was a a um, it was called Amazon Flow, and it might still exist that Amazon created to help bring that data back and forth. So when we're dealing with event relays, there's a couple of things that we have to keep top of mind. And I'll show you how to set up the whole event relay in a second, but this isn't all of them that we can think about, but I think these are the most relevant ones when it comes to this group and what we're thinking about. So when you're deleting an event, relay, um, when you delete the event relay, the corresponding Amazon event bridge is deleted an event bus that is associated with that partner event source is not affected. So for right now, just think about the parole event bridge and event really kind of as a one-to-one, -one. they're paired and tied together. And once one, once that event really is deleted, that bridge will be deleted. But the partner event source actually stays there um, and it's not affected. The other thing with event relays is that they are copied um, to sandboxes. So when you're doing clones from like production or you're cloning any sandbox, you have to recreate these events. So they won't necessarily restart. Um, and actually, I don't know if it's properly documented now, but even when um, you're moving to something like um, Hyperforce, the events at one point, I think the documentation had said they would restart. They actually weren't restarting and that was a bug that was out there. I think they've properly documented it now and either have told people you have to restart your events by yourself or they actually cloned them now. Another thing to keep top of mind is packaging when it comes to event relays. So because the event relays don't support namespaces, so the things like the event channel and its members and the name credential, so you can't really package them. Now, if you're using a unmanaged package, 
you can have it, the event relay as part of it, but you have to make sure that you're adding all the different reference points to the name credentials and the references. And it won't add it automatically, so you have to go in and manually add it. Nadina, can I ask, um, can I ask you a question? This is, somebody sort of asked this question in advance and this this might be a good time to ask it. So for, so probably folks on the call are probably familiar with like platform events, the concept of like an event bus in Salesforce. And I'm assuming for, you know, myself and a lot of folks on the call, like, Salesforce is somewhat the center of our universe, right? So the idea of having a an event bus there makes sense. Can you talk about why? I think the question was why. So we've got this event bus in Salesforce that's orchestrating events. And now we've got another event bus in AWS that's orchestrating events. Like how how should they be playing together? Why would you need both to kind of side by side? Like, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. And so the way how I like to think about it when it comes to any technologies like that, right? AWS, Amazon Web Services, they have their own technology. They have their own stack. So they will have their own um, ecosystem where they need that eventing bus, um, that eventing bus type architecture and to do event driven integrations. On the Salesforce side, same thing. We have our whole ecosystem or different clouds or different connectors. And so we need an eventing bus there. Now, when it comes to uh, talking to uh, event bus, event bus, that's where the event really is that joiner. So it wouldn't be a either or where it's, oh, I'm going to use the Salesforce event bus or use the Amazon um, event bridge, which is essentially their version of a bus. It's more of, where is the data flowing to? How can I get the data there? And then once it's in that ecosystem, how can I now make sure that my event-driven architecture is happening um, to the same type of enterprise standards? And so that's where, as we're passing events from Salesforce to Amazon, event really, really is that bridge that says, okay, from one bus to another, how can I get it there? And then once it goes into AWS, from like a Salesforce side, we necessarily might not be looking into it, but then from an AWS side, that same type of event-driven architecture where you have your different um, subscribers, consumers, and having the bus push out to all those different consumers can happen. Awesome. Thank you. And so I think this is where I'll pivot just a little bit to talk about event really in action. The best way for me to show this is actually you should show it the end-to-end -end process because I think it's a little hard to just show what the event relay is doing versus what uh, Amazon is doing. So I'm going to show it end-to-end -end and then we'll dissect it as we keep going into it. So hopefully all of these are working. So right now, what you'll see, if I have a just random lead in Salesforce. And then on the Amazon side, and we'll get back to these steps once we have time. Um, let me just go to, I'm just going to show you essentially in the bus, my custom bus, I have a rule called lead events. And then what I actually want to just show you is the logs. So what I've set up end to end is a change data capture, on leads so that anytime you make a change on leads, the event really um, will get that change. It will push it on the event bus and then these logs will happen in Amazon. So if you see that I have uh, my log streaming here, I had a test earlier today. So what I just want to show you really quick is the, the rate of change, right? So this part that I'm doing right here to trigger the change is just a standard let me just move the zoom bar. It's just a standard change data capture. So basically I'm saying I'm using the lead, stand, lead standard change data capture. Every time I make a change, log it. And what it's doing is it's going to push it on the event relay and it's going to push it to the Amazon side on the event bus and we'll see it come up in logs. So if I refresh this now,
oh, sorry, wrong one. If I refresh the logs that I have here, we should see another entry. And sometimes it takes a little bit watching these logs. It's not the funnest thing to watch. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you'll see that I have another update here. And then what we're really seeing on the AWS side is the entire payload for what has changed. And then it will tell me what the change type was, which was an update in this case, what was modified. So the phone feel, of course, the last modified is going to be in there as well, because from a Salesforce perspective, that feel always updates anytime you make a change. And then it has some other transactional information in it. So end-to-end, -end, that was just me using the Salesforce technology and the Amazon technology and pushing data from Salesforce to Amazon. Now, when it comes to setting up the event relay, these steps are a, I like to call them a one-time step, but they're very critical that you set them up in a very specific order because sometimes there's a little bit of confusion that can happen. So how I typically set it up, and it's a one-time step, so once you set it up, it's set up, is that I, I usually will do it directly from Postman. And so what I did was I cloned the Salesforce developer repo, and I actually just created some endpoints to do it. Now, some of it you can configure in Salesforce, which I will show you, and some of it you have to do it, um, you have to do it either within the UI or within Postman directly, so it doesn't allow you to do that. So when it comes to setting up the event relay, a couple of things you have to think about. Are you going to do custom events? Or are you going to use a standard event? In my case, I did a standard event. When it comes to actually creating the event, I can create the events now in Salesforce. Um, that was not the case before. You had to do it all through Postman. But if you go to setup and you go to event relay, you will see a you will see my one event that I have set up right now. And there's a couple of things that it requires, which is, you know, it has like a label, it has a state of run, it has some error error recovery options. So in case something happens or it skips. And then also, I'll just cancel that. It requires like a name credential to be set up as well. So you can see which partner event sources here, um, what channel I have, my very unique name potential that I've created, and then I don't have any error recovery options. So if you're setting up the event really, one of the first things you'd want to do is do your name potential. You can do that via just going to name credentials under security, and you have to create a legacy one. And the way how to set it up is that you have to know your AWS, what region, and then your account number. So on the AWS side, if you can see, I'm in US East 1. And then my account ID is this. And that is how you would set up that name credential as legacy. So I can edit that just to show you. And so once all of that is set up, identity type is name principal, no authentication, and then just a generalized header. Once you have that set up under the event relay, you can go through a WYSIWYG type um, style and say, I'm doing a new event relay. Then it will ask where's what name credential. So that's why that has to already be pre-set up. Then you would tell it what channel. So is it for change events or if it's for custom? So mine was for change events. And then this is where I was asking about error recovery. Mine's not checked because I did mine via Postman in the API. And so unless I specifically specify it uh, when I send a body, which I did not, I didn't have to check it, but you can decide how you want error recovery to happen. And that will set up the event relay. The other piece about now setting up the event relay is the channel and the channel members. So you can have one channel with multiple channel members. That part is not a setup that you can do in the UI. That's a part you actually have to do via um, any REST tool. I typically use Postman. So I'm just going to show that really quick. If you can see, and let me just spin. So if you can see here for the um, 
let's see. Yeah. So if you can see here, I have one endpoint from my platform event channel. I specify it as data. So it's change data capture. I give it a name. I hit that endpoint. It will create it. And then specifically for my channel member, I am doing it on the leave change event. So if I wanted to do another out of box one, I could do account and I can have multiple channel members as part of one channel. Again, hit that endpoint and that would create it. And then for my event really specifically, this is how I create the event really from Postman, but I showed you just now how to do it from the UI. And the last thing would actually be to start uh, the event really. So, so Nadine, that, oh, go oh, ahead. No, I was just gonna ask you. So everything, all those um, post methods that you're doing, those mm -hmm. are those are just you're just configuring this event relay piece. Like like you said, once once you've done these these four post calls, it's configured and it's ready to use, or however many. Right. Once once that's done, once everything has been started, the event relay part is done. Right. The next part is now you'd have to configure the Amazon event bridge um, items. But before I go into configuring that part, let's baseline on what is Amazon event bridge so that we can have the same understanding. So when it comes to Amazon event bridge, like I was talking about before, it's very similar to the Salesforce event bus. Very same, very similar architecture. It's serverless and it's meant for scalable um, event-driven applications. The way how I see it is Amazon Event Bridge is the equivalent of the Salesforce Event Bus just on the Amazon side. The biggest thing about the Event Bridge is that it has two processes. So the Event Bus, which we typically do a lot of talking about, but then there's also something called Pipes. So if you see from this picture here, this one really more focuses on here's our event bus, here's our different events, we can create rules. And then these targets are meant to be any targets that we have either within the Amazon ecosystem or um, any other SaaS application it might be connected to. Now, when I talk about the event buses, they're more like routers that receive events and deliver them and they can have zero or more targets. Whereas when we get to the pipes, they're very streamlined one-to-one. -one. Um, so you have your multiple event sources that the event bus can take in, and then it can deliver to as many targets as you need. So that event bus architecture is really suited for when you have a lot of targets, you, um, you have like optional transformation, and you know that you're going to be delivering to more than one. Some more common use cases for when you would use the event bus um, in event bridge is brokering between different workloads and services. So that's more of if you're doing things like with Lambda and other AWS um, specific uh, products. Another good one is when it comes to uh, dividing up event traffic. Um, so if you're doing different events where you're Maybe one specific target can't have, like PII data is a good example. So you're wanting to make sure that you have rules in place to say, okay, this target can receive this information, this target should receive that type of information, and et cetera. So the bus is really good for defining that. And then aggregation of events. Again, it's very much a, it can take in a lot of different targets. It can do a little transformation with the rules and then it can send them out to whichever targets that you're trying to do. Nadina, can you give an example of when you talk about targets, are those like different AWS services? Is it, can you talk about what, what those would be? Yeah. So it can be either AWS services or it can be other SaaS applications because again, from a event driven architecture, even AWS, right, wants to be able to connect with other ecosystems. And so they have it set up in a way where they have, they call them partnerships or partners. So like Salesforce is one of their partners and that can be one of their targets. And that's why that relationship can be bi-directional, but they also partner with like other SaaS applications as well. So this could be like what, 
in, in theory, this you could be using AWS and EventBridge as like your your middleware between Salesforce and another enterprise app. Yeah. So from like your event driven architecture, you could um, do that. Again, um, I think like when you're thinking about that high level enterprise landscape and you're looking at what's the tool to do what, it really comes back down now to capabilities, what you're trying to achieve, making sure that you're not um, duplicating efforts or duplicating data across the ecosystem. And so that's the kind of consideration you would have where if, okay, I have Amazon event bridge, I have Salesforce event bus, I might have Kafka running around for messaging, right? Who should connect with what will really now come down to where does that data need to go? What are the systems in play? And then sometimes it comes down to as well as familiarity, because if you have a very strong AWS team, and then you buy Salesforce, they might not know how to use the Salesforce event architecture. So a, a really good use case here would be once that data gets to Amazon, maybe the AWS team is the one who handles now orchestrating across the rest of the ecosystem just because the enterprise was positioned that way before. Yeah, I, I love this and actually, so, we have a very good example of this at our organization. I uh, work at a financial services company and we build, uh, well, our organization builds apps on uh, Rosa. So OpenShift apps that mm -hmm. live on live on Amazon. And so these custom apps, could, it could be like an underwriting app. And that under underwriting app that lives on Amazon um, has some custom output that they need to send to the enterprise through integration and uh, we could use this pattern to send some of that output directly to to salesforce right exactly i, I love this thank you nadina I'm, le I'm learning this is awesome you're welcome no you're good yeah i think when it comes to playing with other apps and playing with any anything in the enterprise is really getting down to understanding what that system does, what's the capabilities, and then what are you trying to do? It's it's typically comes down to a data problem, right? How is that data needing to flow? What's the best pattern? Should it be an event-driven pattern? Sometimes it's not, and then sometimes you're looking at other patterns, and so other tools might be used, right? Like if I was doing bulk data, I wouldn't necessarily do an eventing pattern. This is more like a ETL extract transform load issue. And so then it's when I would be looking at more, okay, what's my ETL tools and ETL capabilities that I have on the enterprise? So at least for me and my role, like Salesforce is not the only enterprise application we have. And so we always have to look at, even if a system can do both things, does it make sense to have that system do all those capabilities? Nadina, on that, Actually, so first off, Nadine, do you mind? We're like asking you questions throughout. Is that okay, or do you want to? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's what good. I thought, but I just want to make sure. Um, <clears throat> so there is a question actually on the, a little bit on the topic that you just mentioned that we have in the chat um, about different sort of types of um, integration events versus CDC versus ETL. So the question is. Um, is the configuration for event relay confined to CDC only, or the custom channel is used to map? I think the question is, or can the custom channel be used to map a platform event as well? So you could do a platform event. You can do both um, CDC and platform events. Let me just back up a little bit. Um, really, when you... Right, yeah. So you can do platform, I wanted to back up to this slide. You can do platform events, you can do change capture events. Again, really what you're thinking about when you're sending these types of events, it's more like a streaming type architecture, right? So platform events, change data capture events, very good for this type of use case. And you can do custom platform events as well. Um, some things to just keep in mind is I think the payload sizes between like Salesforce and how you're sending these things have to be small, but then from a platform event, change data capture event, they already have to be small either way. So that's where the strengths of event relay and this type of architecture, this event driven architecture works really well.
but yeah, keep asking questions because these are really good. So now um, when it comes to the event bridge pipes, these are really more point-to-point -point integration. So event source in, target out. And it's really, it's really good for receiving those events from a single source, doing the process and delivery to a single target. Um, the thing about the event bridge pipes is that they actually support more advanced transformation. So whereas your event, um, your event bus can do a little bit of transformation, the pipes can actually do more transformation. I haven't played with the pipes too much because I've seen a use case where I need to do like a point to point integration, but that's something to keep in mind. And that's why I wanted to make sure that we highlighted that. So now I'm going to switch back into Amazon. And let me just start from the top because I know I showed you the end to end. Um, but when it comes to the event bridge, there's a couple of things we have to do. So the first thing when we come in is when you're first setting it up, you will have a custom bus that is created. So mine was created and you have to activate, you have to activate it. Once you've activated this bus, you'll see that there's also a default one. That default one is always there. So as you get more um, buses added from other different SaaS applications or whatever applications, they can still show up here. You can search for them. So if you see in here, I configured a rule. Now, when it comes to creating these rules, it's a very intricate step. So I'll take you through it. I'm not going to delete this one because sometimes I forget some of the steps. So bear with me as I'm going through it. But as you're creating these rules, what you're really telling the Amazon event bus is, what do I need to do? What do I need to show on the Amazon side? So for creating the rule, there's a rule name, there's a description, and then there's the eventing bus. I'm just going to put in anything for now because we, we're not worried about that part. The event source is the important thing here. You want to make sure it says AWS events or a bread bridge partners. And then you want to make sure it says AWS events here. Now, I typically skip this sample JSON, but if you have a JSON that you want to put in, you can. But because Salesforce is a partner, you can go to event bridge partners under the event source. And then on the partners, I just want to show you the list. So there's Adobe, there's other Amazon APIs, um, there's Art Zero, Atlassian. But what we're interested in is the Salesforce. And you'll see here, okay, so that connection is still there. That's Amazon flow that I was talking about earlier, but we would stick to just the Salesforce partner. And then for the event type, um, depending on what we did or change data capture on, mine was on lead, so I can just show you that it has all the objects because it knows about our instance since we configured the event really, and it created that partner attribute in, um, in Amazon for us in event bridge. So Nadine, I, quick question oh, just on the object list is it so you you have changed data capture mm -hmm. um defined on the lead mm -hmm. um so basically for this i guess my question is how how come it's showing all the objects like you you'd need to configure cdc on the particular object that you're choosing right or or no so with CDC, it comes standard on a lot of objects. Um, let okay. me just double check. I think most of the standard objects CDC comes configured on. So that's why they're all showing. So if you see here, uh, it's checking for like page change events. So this is just Salesforce out of the box that it knows. Um, so if I choose like lead, which is what I did, it's just going to be looking for the lead change event because this is a standard. Um, account is another one that I know. I think all objects have CDC enabled on them by default. I'll double check that as I'm going through this, but it's not, uh, this isn't like a AWS thing. This is more of a Salesforce um, standard out of the box capability that you can do change data capture. Now, and had I created a custom platform event, that would have also shown up here. I don't have one on my system, but it would have shown up as like a regular object. Yeah. And so that's why you're seeing all these um, objects because they have the ability to do change data capture on them. 
Now, once you have, just to stick with it, once you have that event pattern done, um, then what you want to do is you want to choose CloudWatch Log Group. And this is where you would create that lead event, account event, whatever the event is so that it will log it. And then once everything is good, it's going to ask you if you want to do any tags, then it will ask you to review everything and then you would hit save. So I'll hit cancel. So we go back to the rules and we can just click on our lead event. That's the, the, the one that I already have pre-configured. So here's our lead change event. That was the target I went to because the logs actually live in the CloudWatch log group. And so it's looking at my different logs here and then any monitoring, I don't know if the dashboard will show up. Yeah, so any monitoring or anything that's happening, um, this is again on the AWS side. I didn't do any specific tags for it, but that's really more of a, how do I want to label it on the AWS side? So this is where you can see, and I hit on the integration, the partner event sources. This is where you will see your event uh, bus show up and it will be in an inactive status. I thought I had one that was deactivated, but perhaps I deleted it. But you'll see essentially, here's your partner event, the source, the bus name, when I created it many months ago. Um, and it just basically, once you activate that, that's how you're now associating it onto the bus. Here's my partner event. Here's how I'm building that trusted connection with Salesforce and associating it with this event bus. And then from there, really, that's the high level when it comes to setting this up, right? Once you get past the event relay part, once you've configured some rules on the event bus, you can just send information. And this is just a one way. Um, if you want to go back the other way, then you have to do some configurations on the AWS side. But this is how you would set it up from a event relay and the event bridge. And again, the event relay is like a one-time setup, but it's a little uh, tedious because you have to do so many steps to get it done. And so that's why I typically have it configured in Postman so I can just execute all the steps at once. Okay, so let's talk about some principles when it comes to event-driven integration. Um, I think for the most part, some of these we might already know or we might not, but just things to keep in mind is that you really do want to identify key business events and having those trigger points or what should happen when and those actions are very important so that you can decide if this should be something that's event-driven or some other type of architecture. When it comes to your workflows, you want to keep them lean. So you want to have them as efficient um, as possible from an eventing perspective. So if you're doing something where you need all this data, you might just want to send the IDs for now, or you don't want to send every single change via CDC. You might just want to spend, send a specific small uh, platform event or a custom platform event. So keeping it lean just to avoid any unnecessary complexities. Implementing the error handling. So you saw an event really, I should have it on, but I didn't have mine on so that you can monitor it. And then even on the AWS side, I did set up the logs so that we can see what is happening, make sure everything's coming across and the integration is running smoothly. And then optimizing the performance and the scale. This is where, as you're looking at it, you might decide, okay, I don't really have a lot of target systems right now. Should I set up? EA event bus or should I do the, the pipes? I like to build for scale. So let's always assume that we'll have zero or one now, but we could have many later. And so the bus is typically what I go with. But again, the trade-off there is you can't do too much transformation in the bus as you could like with the event pipes. So that's just something to keep in mind. Any other questions. I think, let me see, I have one more slide. I think this, yeah, my call to action. So this is the documentation on the event relay. I will say it's pretty robust. 
um, if you have trouble setting it up the very first time, do let me know. I recorded like just a couple of videos of me setting it up so that it's more detailed and understood. Um, from an AWS perspective, there's really good documentation on how to use the bus, when to use the pipes, and the way how I got familiar with, okay, I'm not working with AWS every day. How do I get familiar with this? Is I literally just configured it and played with it. So I configured my little Amazon account. I configured my Salesforce account. And I played with, okay, what can I do CDC? Do I need to, how, how would I do platform events? And just practiced and understood how the integration works. But if we don't have any more questions, then thank you so much for having me. Um, we can talk about anything else, or we can go into more detail specifically on any one of the topics. Nadina, I put an unfair question in chat um, that I don't necessarily expect you to know the answer to, but I just, it's a thought process that was going in my head as you did this wonderful presentation. Let me try. Okay, so is the event bus concept specific to AWS or do other platforms also have event bus models, Azure, Google, et cetera? Um, so I wouldn't say event bus concepts specific to AWS. The way how I would say it is the eventing architecture because many platforms will have that eventing type architecture, right? So similar to, AWS, like I said, AWS has the event bus and the whole event bridge type, how to do many um, applications on the Salesforce side is just called the Salesforce event bus. I'm sure that the other hyperscalers like Google Azure will have some type of eventing architecture because this is eventing and doing streaming is something a lot of the, the big vendors, the big um, enterprise applications just have. It just might be called something different. Now, do I know what they're called? I do not. Um, but I'm sure a quick Google of what is similar to Amazon Event Bridge in like Azure or Google will probably come up. Thank you. You're welcome. Nadina, I've got um, a question for you in turn. This came up in another session. Um, mm -hmm. I here is there anything is there like when when you were going through your your presentation i was thinking about scenarios where it's like kind of like the example you provided a lead is updated you know and it's and in that sort of the it's it's a it's a relatively sort of lower manageable volume of changes is there anything that folks should keep in mind where this doesn't scale to like a higher volume of changes that are happening? So I would say the biggest thing to keep in mind, um, I'm always concerned with whenever you're doing any type of streaming, the payload side has to be pretty small because again, streaming, it's requiring that small payload. And actually let me look that up because that was something I don't know if I have it correct that on the Salesforce side, it's like one KB and then on the AWS S side is different. So let me just look that up right quick so that I can give you the right number. But the, the size of what you're trying to do needs to be small. And then with anything where you're trying to design the integration, this one is very much more, here's the event, here's how it's driven. Make sure that it's the right application to do an event-driven architecture because sometimes that might not be the case, right? You might just be trying to, hey, I saw this cool thing, I'm trying to use it, and it's really not a good use case for it. Let me... I was trying to find what the actual size needs to be, but I don't see it. Okay, well, I'll get back to that as I'm looking at it. But yeah, the the size of it and the size of the events um, to possibly be a thing. And then on the Salesforce side, right, you have to think about your limits. So like it's going to use the, if you're using platform events, it's going to use that allotment of limits. So 
keeping those in mind when you're starting to send these types of events, these types of changes as well. Um, and Stuart has a follow-up um, seeing that organizations i'll just read it i see organizations that put everything in their streaming events it feels like overkill would best practice be to just put in the data that that you need to complete the action for simplicity yeah, that, that's an interesting one because i think you know it's one of those um it's like a hammer you have a nail and everything like seems like a hammer um i would say streaming events when it comes to streaming anything it should be light it should be simple i think where there's always a lot of confusion is like do you actually need the whole record or do you just need some of the changes and then from there what is the action that you need to happen after those changes so what's like the end-to-end -end data flow because sometimes i might not need a event type bridge architecture, I might need to use something like an enterprise service bus because I need not only to get the data to me to do transformations, I also needed to do listening um, and then sending data back and forth. So I wouldn't put everything in the streaming events. I would try to keep it as simple as possible. In any model that you're using, think about all the different types of integration patterns and one of the things I've learned working like with enterprise customers is when you work on an enterprise, even though the change might seem small, it takes a long time to undo. So you just want to make sure you're building for that lasting ability. So if today you think, yeah, I can just put all the streaming events in one and we'll fix it later, the later never comes. So just try to design it from the get-go while you have that initial architecture. Awesome. Uh, before we before we wrap, any other any other folks have questions? Now I can see the chat now. <laughs> awesome. Well, Nadina, thank you so much. This was awesome. I have I have more detailed questions that I don't want to bore everybody with, so I'll probably email those you email those to you offline but um this was awesome thank you so much it's really you're great. welcome yeah and you know how to find me so thank you yeah that was great all right thanks everybody have a great uh have a great afternoon evening day wherever you are and we'll see you next time thanks everyone bye thank you bye, -bye. bye thank you